Chest X-ray image quality can substantially impact clinical decision-making. High quality images enhance our ability to extract valuable information that helps us make good clinical decisions, while low quality images lead to false positives and false negatives that can fool us into making wrong clinical decisions. Low quality images also contribute to more inconsistent interpretations since every radiologist must make personal subjective judgments about how well an image can or cannot answer the question at hand and every radiologist must make personal subjective adjustments in their efforts to avoid overcalling or undercalling. Consistent quality from one chest x-ray to the next is also an important aspect of chest x-ray image quality. Consistency allows for easier image comparisons, helps learners build mental templates for normal more efficiently, and permits radiologists to more confidently rely on pattern recognition, which in aggregate lead to better performance in the reading room. There are five aspects or determinants of chest x-ray quality I'll discuss. The first one is patient positioning. These two photos of Prince William were taken at the same exact moment and always remind me how poor patient positioning can sometimes tell us the wrong story. In order to avoid misdiagnoses on a chest x-ray, proper patient positioning is key. The coronal plane of the patient should be parallel to the film and the center of the patient's chest should be centered on the film. Images in an upright position are preferred though may not always be an option for trauma patients, ICU patients, and some inpatients. We characterize patient positioning according to four attributes, rotation, angulation, centering, and posture. Let's tackle rotation first. Here's a cross-sectional illustration of a properly positioned patient relative to an x-ray film. For reference, I've marked the trachea with a blue dot and the spinal canal with a red dot. Rotation can result in apparent tracheal displacement on a chest x-ray, which could be misinterpreted as a sign of a mediastinal mass. In a properly positioned patient, x-ray beams travel through the same amount of anterior chest wall tissue on the right side and the left side. With rotation, however, X-ray beams may travel through more anterior chest wall tissue on one side than the other and cause one side of the chest to seem homogeneously denser, which could be misinterpreted as a layering unilateral pleural effusion. Here's a properly positioned patient and the width of the shadow cast by the heart upon their X-ray film. Because the long axis of the heart runs diagonally, patient rotation in a left posterior oblique direction may cause the heart to cast a wider shadow and be misinterpreted as cardiomegaly sometimes. While patient rotation in a right posterior oblique direction can cause the heart to cast a smaller shadow and might cause an enlarged heart to be misinterpreted as normal in size. When a patient is rotated, one hilum will move closer to the x-ray film and the other will move further away. Since objects further away from an x-ray film cast larger shadows on the film, rotation may result in a misinterpretation of unilateral hilar enlargement. Let's look at some real chest x-rays. Here's a chest x-ray of a patient who's rotated in a right posterior oblique direction. Notice how the trachea appears to be displaced right of midline how the left chest appears homogeneously whiter, how this enlarged heart appears relatively normal in size, and how the left hilum seems enlarged compared to the right hilum. Recognize that your patient is rotated on their x-ray by looking at where the thoracic spine is situated relative to the midpoint between the medial ends of the clavicles. If a patient is rotated, the thoracic spine will be displaced away from this midpoint. In this chest x-ray of a properly positioned patient, notice that the thoracic spine overlaps the midpoint between the medial ends of both clavicles. While in this chest x-ray of a patient who's rotated, the thoracic spine has shifted away from the midpoint between the medial ends of both clavicles. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize that your patient is rotated, Avoid overcalling tracheal displacement, 
layering unilateral pleural fusions, or unilateral hilar enlargement. And remember that your estimate of heart size could potentially be off in either direction depending on which direction the patient was rotated. Now let's talk about angulation. Here's a properly positioned patient and the lucency cast by the lungs upon the x-ray film. Lordotic angulation may cause the lung volumes to seem smaller than they really are. And kyphotic angulation can as well. Lordotic angulation can cause the heart to seem smaller, while kyphotic angulation may cause the heart to seem larger. Here are two chest x-rays of the same patient. In one image, the patient is properly positioned, while in the other, they're lordotically angulated. Notice how the lung volumes seem lower on the lordotic image. This is an optical illusion since a larger region of the posterior lower lobes are actually projecting inferior to the hemidiaphragm domes and over the upper abdomen on the lordotic image. Also, notice how the heart is foreshortened and appears slightly smaller. Here are two chest x-rays of another patient. In one image, they're properly positioned, while in the other, they're kyphotically angulated. Notice how the lung volumes seem lower on the kyphotic image and how the heart seems larger. Recognize that your patient is angulated on their chest x-ray by checking where the medial clavicles lie. If the medial clavicles lie superior to the lung apices, you're probably dealing with a lordotically angulated chest x-ray. And if the medial clavicles are at the level of the aortic arch, you're probably dealing with a kyphotically angulated chest x-ray. In this chest x-ray of a properly positioned patient, the medial clavicles overlap the lung apices and lie superior to the aortic arch. While in this chest x-ray of a patient who's lordotically angulated, the medial clavicles project superior to the lung apices. And in this chest x-ray of a patient who's kyphotically angulated, the medial clavicles lie at the level of the aortic arch. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize that your patient is angulated, avoid overcalling low lung volumes and bibasilar lung opacities. And remember that your estimate of heart size could be off in either direction depending on the direction of angulation. Poor centering may exclude areas of peripheral chest anatomy from visual assessment. On this trauma bay chest x-ray, who knew that a small left apical pneumothorax and a left humeral neck fracture were present just past the upper and left margins of this image? While on this image, how comfortable would you be ruling out a small apical pneumothorax? Or ruling out a small lateral left lung base nodule on this chest x-ray? Recognize that your patient is properly centered on their chest x-ray by checking if their spine is horizontally centered on the image and if their T7 vertebral body is vertically centered. In a properly centered image, you should see all of the lung fields, particularly the apices, lateral basilar margins, and costophrenic angles. You should be able to see the first ribs and the lateral margins of ribs 1 through 10 completely on both sides. Here's a chest x-ray of a properly centered patient. The first ribs are visible. If the vertebral body they articulate with is T1, we can see that the T7 vertebral body is vertically centered on this image and that the thoracic spine is horizontally centered. The lateral margins of ribs 1 through 10 are captured in their entirety and the costophrenic angles are completely captured as well. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize that your patient is poorly centered, any excluded regions could always hide something important. Since the lung apices, lateral ribs, and chest wall are near the periphery of most chest x-rays, pneumothoraces and rib fractures are at the top of the list. Patient posture can influence chest x-ray interpretations. Here's an example of a patient who had an upright PA chest x-ray and a supine AP portable chest x-ray on the same morning. Patients in a supine position tend to take a shallower inspiration than when they're upright, which can make the lung appear diffusely denser and cause pulmonary vascular crowding that together might get misinterpreted as mild pulmonary edema or pulmonary venous congestion. A shallower inspiration will also foreshorten the mediastinum craniocaudally, causing the heart to appear larger 
and the mediastinum to appear wider. Recognize whether your patient is upright or supine on their chest x-ray by checking for an air fluid level in the stomach and looking at how much of the lungs the scapular bodies overlap. An air fluid level in the stomach tells us the patient was upright. Substantial overlap of the lungs by the scapular bodies and absence of a gastric air fluid level suggests the patient was supine. Here's an upright chest x-ray and you can see the air fluid level in the stomach below the left hemidiaphragm. Here's another upright chest x-ray. Notice how laterally displaced the scapular bodies are relative to the lungs compared to a supine chest x-ray where the scapular bodies overlap much more of the lungs. Posture isn't only about upright versus supine position, but also how the head and neck are held. Pronounced neck flexion can cause the patient's chin to obscure portions of the lung apices and upper mediastinum. Here's a chest x-ray of a properly positioned patient. The patient's chin is nowhere to be seen. However, on this chest x-ray, the patient's chin encroaches upon the lower neck and thoracic inlet. And on this chest x-ray, the patient's chin completely obscures the left lung apex. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize that your patient is in a supine position, be aware that their lung volumes will probably be better as soon as they're upright. Avoid overcalling pulmonary edema, cardiomegaly, or mediastinal widening. And when you notice that the patient's chin is obscuring part of the chest, remember that it's often the upper lungs that get obscured, which are a popular place for pneumothoraces and lung nodules to sometimes occur. The second determinant of chest x-ray quality is how deep a breath the patient takes. Poorly expanded lungs contain less air and appear uniformly denser, which makes it harder to visualize lung opacities and nodules from the background lung parenchyma. Since the lung vessels also become more crowded and therefore conspicuous, the urge to overcall pulmonary edema can be very hard to resist. There are different reasons why patients' lungs aren't well expanded on a chest x-ray. Sometimes it's a patient issue, such as obesity or restrictive lung disease, or because the patient is sedated or in pain. Other times, it's because of us. Perhaps we didn't communicate the breathing instructions well enough because of a language barrier or other barrier like deafness. Or maybe we weren't carefully watching the patient's breath hold and took the image at the wrong moment. In order to get the best inspiration possible during a chest x-ray, we typically coach our patients to take two deep inspirations rather than just one, since it tends to result in more nicely expanded lungs when the image exposure is made. Here's an illustration of how the amount of inspiration can cause things to look different. I shot these two images on my patients seconds apart after placing two Hickman catheters into them. Besides the lung volumes appearing substantially lower, notice how the cardiac silhouette and mediastinum appear wider on the shallow inspiration image on the right side since the mediastinum is foreshortened. And look at the retrocardiac lung on the shallow inspiration image. Doesn't that look like mild pulmonary edema to you? Here's another example with two portable chest x-rays of the same patient one hour apart. Much more of the upper abdomen is superimposed upon both lower lungs on the shallow inspiration image on the left, resulting in apparent bilateral lung opacification that just might get misinterpreted as atelectasis or pneumonia. The heart appears larger, the mediastinum wider, and the hyla more pronounced as well. Recognize your patient hasn't taken a deep breath by counting the number of posterior ribs superior to the dome of the right hemidiaphragm on their chest x-ray. If you count fewer than 10, you're probably dealing with a suboptimal inspiration. Here's a chest x-ray of a patient with well-expanded lungs. We can count 10 posterior ribs superior to the right hemidiaphragm dome. On this chest x-ray of a patient with low lung volumes, here's the diaphragm, and we can only count six posterior ribs on the right side. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize that the patient's lung volumes are low, avoid overcalling pulmonary edema by basal or lung opacities, cardiomegaly, mediastinal widening, and hyalur enlargement. Image exposure and image contrast 
are the third crucial determinant of chest x-ray quality. Exposure alludes to the amount of x-ray photons that hit the x-ray film. If insufficient x-ray photons hit the film, the image will be underexposed and may appear too light, while if too many x-ray photons hit the film, the image will be overexposed and appear potentially too dark. Both situations can lead to a loss of anatomic information. Poor exposures can sometimes be partly overcome through window and leveling at the time of interpretation. However, underexposure can often be particularly tricky to compensate for. In this underexposed image, the lungs seem diffusely wider than usual relative to the soft tissues and mimic the appearance of pulmonary edema. In this underexposed image, normal structures like the heart and chest wall partly obscure the lower lungs, which can tempt radiologists to overdiagnose lower lung opacities. Since the lateral costophrenic angles are also tough to see, calls of pleural effusion also tend to be less accurate. In this overexposed image, regions of lung appear much darker than usual relative to soft tissues. Pulmonary vessels are less conspicuous, which can contribute to an underdiagnosis of pulmonary edema and pneumonias. Subtle lung findings like pneumothoraces and nodules may also be underdiagnosed as well. Recognize your chest x-ray is overexposed or underexposed these ways. If you can't make out the left hemidiaphragm all the way to the spine, or if you can't distinguish any peripheral lung markings, or if you can't visually make out vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc spaces through the cardiac silhouette, no matter how you window and level, you're probably dealing with an underexposed chest x-ray. On the other hand, if you can't discern central pulmonary vessels, or you can't see any peripheral lung markings, no matter how you window and level, you're probably dealing with an overexposed chest x-ray. Here's a well-exposed chest radiograph. Notice how easy it is to see the left hemidiaphragm at the spine, how we can discern both the central lung vessels and peripheral lung markings, and how well we can see the vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc spaces through the cardiac silhouette. On this underexposed chest x-ray, notice how white the lungs appear relative to the chest wall, how tough it is to discern the left hemidiaphragm next to the spine, how tough it is to see the vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc spaces through the cardiac silhouette, and how tough it is to make out peripheral lung markings from the background lung. On this overexposed chest x-ray, notice how tough it is to see pulmonary vessels in the central left lung and how tough it is to see peripheral lung markings. I certainly don't see peripheral lung markings well enough to confidently say there's no way a pneumothorax is present at the left apex. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize the image is underexposed, avoid overcalling layering bilateral pleural effusions, pulmonary edema, or lower lung opacities. If you're reading a chest x-ray and realize the image is overexposed, beware of your decreased sensitivity for picking up pneumothoraces, pulmonary edema, lung opacities, and lung nodules. That's exposure. Now let's talk about image contrast. Image contrast refers to our ability to visually distinguish two structures of slightly different density from each other on an image. It can be influenced by fixed factors like exposure or malleable factors like window level setting. Because there's so many different structures of varying density on a chest x-ray, it tends to be unusual that image contrast will be optimal for every area of the chest at the same time. For example, The specific window level settings that permit us to resolve the retrocardiac lung parenchyma well may not allow us sufficient image contrast to, say, roll out a pneumothorax at the lung apex. That's why radiologists often constantly adjust and readjust the window and level settings of a chest x-ray image as they move through their search pattern on a chest x-ray. Here are two chest x-ray images, one slightly unexposed, underexposed, and one nicely exposed. While the left hemidiaphragm is visible at the spine and the central pulmonary vessels are discernible on both images, it's really tough to see the vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc spaces through the cardiac silhouette on the left image. Although the image contrast for lung assessment was satisfactory on the left image, the image contrast for the mediastinum and heart were suboptimal on this left image because it was a poorer exposure. 
Fortunately, window leveling the image permits us to attain sufficient image contrast to evaluate the midline chest. Though notice the impact of these particular window level settings on our visualization of the lungs now, as opposed to our well-exposed image on the right. Images with suboptimal exposure tend to require more window level manipulation to achieve sufficient image contrast for a complete diagnostic interpretation of every region in the chest. However, with extra window and leveling effort, a suboptimally exposed chest X-ray image can often be nearly as diagnostic as a well-exposed image. Recognizing if you have enough image contrast for interpretation depends on what part of the chest you're evaluating. If it's the central airways you're assessing, the tracheal and mainstem bronchial air columns should be perceptible in their entirety. If it's the central lungs, the central pulmonary vessels should be visible. If it's the peripheral lungs, the pulmonary vessels in the basal lower lobes inferior to the hemidiaphragm domes should be discernible. And if it's the heart, pulmonary vessels superimposed upon the cardiac silhouette should be discernible. Here's a chest X-ray image that provides sufficient image contrast for the diagnostic evaluation of the central airways, the central lungs, peripheral lungs, and heart simultaneously without any additional window leveling. While well, here's an underexposed image where assessment of the central airways, peripheral lungs, and heart are subdiagnostic. The fourth determinant of chest X-ray quality is image definition. Image definition or spatial resolution alludes to our ability to perceive fine detail on an image. It's objectively defined as the ability for us to visually resolve two separate tiny objects. Subjectively, images with good image definition are ones where sharp anatomic interfaces between structures of different density tend to appear crisp, sharp, and clean, while in images with poor image definition, these interfaces may appear indistinct or fuzzy. If chest x-ray image definition is poor, our ability to see interfaces well is impaired, and we risk underdiagnosing subtle lung, skeletal, and soft tissue disorder. Recognize that chest x-ray image definition is poor by inspecting interfaces that should normally appear sharp, like the domes of the hemidiaphragms, the margins of the pulmonary vessels in the lower lungs, and near the heart, the margin of the cardiac silhouette, and the margins of the ribs. Four factors influence image definition, and one of them is motion blur. Motion blur can be a consequence of voluntary motion that the patient has control over or involuntary motion that the patient has little control of. We minimize unwanted body motion during imaging by avoiding awkward and uncomfortable positions during imaging and coaching our patients well. We minimize respiratory motion blur by keeping patients well oxygenated and by using a tactic where we have the patient take two deep breaths in and then holding the breath. Cardiac motion blur can be avoided with chest X-ray exposure times faster than 1 20th of a second. Sometimes this may require the use of a slightly higher radiation dose, kind of like how bright sunlight allows us to use faster camera shutter speeds. Here's an example of respiratory motion blur on a portable chest X-ray of a patient with large body habitus. And notice how instant distinct the vessel margins are in the lower left lung. Image noise influences image definition too, and the reason is usually that not enough X-ray photons made it onto the film or image detector. This could be because we were over-aggressive at radiation dose reduction or because we were imaging a morbidly obese patient and much of the incident X-ray beam ended up being scattered by the patient's body. Remedies for image noise include increasing the X-ray tube current, which comes at the cost of higher radiation dose to the patient, or increasing the X-ray tube voltage, which can sometimes reduce image contrast. Here's a portable chest X-ray of a morbidly obese patient. Notice how noisy this image compares when, how this uh, image compa uh, paired when compared to a good chest X-ray image. Geometry also influences image definition. Because the X-ray source from which X-rays emanate is not infinitesimally small, 
the extra beams that create our chest x-ray image originate from slightly different points. As a result, any object interface will actually cast a small penumbra on the x-ray film, which results in a slightly indistinct interface on the film that can decrease image definition. If the distance between the x-ray source and object is increased, however, the penumbras cast on the x-ray film become smaller, resulting in sharper interfaces and better image definition on our chest x-ray. Likewise, if the distance between the object and the film is decreased, but the penumbras cast on the x-ray film also become smaller, resulting in sharper interfaces and image definition on our chest x-ray. One of the reasons why image definition is generally better in a thin patient than a morbidly obese patient is because the vital organs we're evaluating tend to be closer to the film in a thin patient. If we compare the way a supine portable AP chest x-ray is shot versus an upright PA chest x-ray, we'll also see that the distance between the x-ray source and the patient is much greater with an upright PA chest x-ray, meaning that an upright chest x-ray provides inherently prov better image definition than a portable chest x-ray, all other factors being equal. Finally, processing artifacts, whether we're dealing with conventional film stream or digital radiography, can influence image definition when they occur, such as the digital compression defect on this chest x-ray, which substantially compromises image definition compared to a good image or the scanning artifact on this CR image. The fifth determinant of chest x-ray quality are artifacts. Artifacts are often external images superimposed on the patient's chest. Things like hair, clothing, and skin folds, for example, can either obscure important anatomic features and cause us to fail to make a diagnosis or mimic pathology and cause us to call something that's really not there. A hair bun can mimic a soft tissue mass. Hair extensions can mimic pneumomediastinum. Skin folds can mimic pneumothoraces. A ventilator tube connector can mimic a lung nodule. Here's a slightly oblique view we shot for confirmation, by the way. A plastic chest port can mimic a lung nodule, as can a button. Shooting a chest x-ray through a cooling blanket can make it hard to see subtle findings on a chest x-ray, as when we shoot through a superimposed body part. That covers five important determinants of chest x-ray image quality. Be familiar with them, not just so you can recognize them, when they occur, but so that you'll be equipped to appropriately adapt your read when they happen.